Wheelhouse DNA. There's a sign outside your studio. I think it says, always say yes. You know, staying positive is a big part of it. And in my show, I talk about how we're all made to mourn, but not forever. We mourn and then we move on. If you don't move on, then a part of you dies. And that's more of a tragedy. It's even another tragedy. From Wheelhouse DNA and Acast, this is Comfort Food, a show about life, loss, grief, celebration, and the meals that support us through it all. I'm your host, Kelly Rizzo. Two years ago this month, I lost my husband, Bob. And so I thought it would be kind of healing to take this month and have some of Bob's best friends and the people who were right there in the thick of grief with me during that time. So in that spirit, Jeff Ross was one of the first people on my list. You may know him as a stand-up comedian or as the Roastmaster General, but Jeff has gone through so much in his life and has some incredible words of wisdom to share. So with all that said, please join me in welcoming Jeff Ross. Hey, welcome to the podcast. I'm Kelly Rizzo's friend, (laughs) Jeff Ross. I mean, I kind of like that. I'm here between one fern and (laughs) two ferns. We can just call this next to a fern. Yeah, beside a fern. We got a candle to protect you from uh, Kelly's farts. <laughs> and she's wearing her sneakers from high school. And she has a lot of booze. I'm sitting over here with a table like I'm at the hospital about to be fed <laughs> hospital food. I don't know what. You know what? That's what Bob would always say. Anytime I would serve him in like a small bowl, like if I would give him some ice cream and give him like a little bowl of it. He's like, what am I in a nursing home? Why do you feed me like I'm in a nursing home? <laughs> he uh, always referred to nursing home. Or like if I would bring him food in bed, he'd be like, hold on, let me sit up. I, I don't want to feel like I'm in a nursing home. And then I was like, can you stop foreshadowing like nursing homes, please? Yeah. He uh, he wouldn't have done well in a nursing home. Uh, No. <laughs> no. And actually, well, we can talk about that in a minute, but... Start the um, show. I mean, I didn't right. start, but you should really start it. Well, well, Jeff, thank you for being here on oh. Comfort Food. Hi. Great. Great. Thank I'm you. You're very, welcome. Very... It should also be called, called Comfort Chair because it's very comfortable. Oh, well. The lighting, however, I feel like I'm being interrogated by... Uh... It's slightly less comforting, but it's a nice soft focus. I promise we will look great. What am I, Barbara Streisand? <laughs> Dim the lights. <laughs> Oh, God, I love Nothing you. Nothing against Barbara, but um, I love her. She always has that soft focus. Oh. Well. It's great. I didn't know I, that you won the uh, marathon. This is awesome. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, <laughs> it's the Paris filter of, of lights. Um, so I wanted to have you on here because you were the most and one of the most and the most instrumental people in my life when it came to getting through the most difficult time I ever had to go through. Not only were you one of the first people literally on site and there at my house with me. When Bob passed away. When Bob passed away, not only were you one of his dearest friends, but you, I know, were also being there for me and for his girls. But you have shown up for me every step of the way since, and most importantly, have shown up for Bob still every step of the way since. You have still gone so far above and beyond, and I know, of course, you're going to say, it's fine, it's no problem, it's nothing, but it's a big deal what you've done for him and for his legacy since he passed. And I'm just eternally grateful to you and always will be, and um, I just love you so much. And so I'm so happy we're here and we get to chat in this forum jeff oh you got me you got me Kel. well i don't know where to jump into that but i remember that day all too well it's only been a couple of years but i remember like it was yesterday but feels like yesterday beyond all that stuff with uh you you know you're a great friend you're, you're there for your friends as well and i want to always be there for you well thank you, you know bob that is something that he passed on to us as his, as someone, you know, he cared about, uh, both of us. You know, in a way, you're like a sister and a friend and a cousin and all that wrapped into one because, you know, if you knew Bob long enough, 
you got his philosophies on life, you got his sense of humor, and you got a lot of his wisdom. So that's so rare uh, that how many people are going to know Bob the way you and I know Bob? So we have to be friends. Yeah. And now we have our own history together, which is how life works. I know. And I'm just so fortunate that he had such incredible friends that then I was able to join the club of and feel a part of um, because it's not every day that somebody has such an incredible circle of people surrounding them that he did. And obviously that says a lot about him, but it says a lot about his friends too. And I just feel very lucky that I get to continue to swim in the pond of of Bob friends. <laughs> I can't walk through an airport and not see Bob from behind, from the side. You know, everybody kind of, there's always, he's always at the top of my, and I go to the comedy store a few nights a week when I'm in Los Angeles and you can't turn your head to the left or right in any of the hallways without seeing a picture of Bob from some point in his long, long history at the in comedy clubs. So Bob and I talk about him in my show all the time. I do a one-man show, uh, and Bob comes up all the time in the show. That means a lot that I found out you talk about him in your show. And I know, you know his girls were so happy about that, and Adam was so happy about that, and uh, that's just really special. Yeah, well, you'll have to come see it. I'm going to do it um, some more uh, after the new year, you know, in, into, into the new year. Uh, I'm going to do it more this year. Take a banana for the ride. Take a banana for the ride, which is something my grandfather used to say to me when I was an open mic comedian. (laughs) He'd give me money for tolls and a banana. He'd say, take a banana for the ride. That's that's good advice. It is. You never know what's (laughs) going to happen. I've done it before. It was sort of my grandfather's way of saying, be ready for anything. Life, pain, stuff, hunger. It all can come at you sort of suddenly and unexpectedly. And I learned that in my life. And... This is actually a version of a show that I did as a young man after losing my grandfather and uh, after losing Bob and uh, Norm MacDonald and Gilbert Gottfried all within eight months. I looked back at the old show and said, wow, what was I thinking about as a young man when I lost my grandfather and my parents at a young age? What was I thinking about then? And then when I lost three good buddies in a row uh, more recently, um, it made me realize that I had learned a lot about bouncing back and how how to be resilient and how to turn that um, uh, sadness into art and how to turn a, f- a, a sour mood in, in, into a, a better mood. And sometimes it's just putting a fake smile on my face and hoping it becomes a real smile. And more often than not, it does. So that's a little bit of the fake it till you make it. Uh, kind of. That's idea, more. Of a, that's right? more. I think that's more for tap dancing. Uh, but <laughs> and but it's true. That, like a lot yeah. of people say, like even if you're not happy, if you just force yourself to smile, it's going to then become a natural smile. Mm. Like because you can't smile and then not end up feeling happy at some point. I just go with it. It's like it's like to me. It's just trying to. You know, there's a sign outside your studio. I think it says "Always say yes." You know, staying positive is a big part of it. And in my show, I talk about how we're all made to mourn, but not forever. We mourn and then we move on. If you don't move on, then a part of you dies. And that's more of a tragedy. It's even another tragedy. So very important to me. And the bananas are good because, you know, you can turn them sideways and they remind you to smile. (laughs) So true. And it's yellow like a smiley face. Bananas, they're like people. They get bruised, but they're still sweet. I love that, Josh. You know, <laughs> and that is that is some actual advice that I remember regularly getting from you ever since Bob passed. Mm. Is you would say to me, in a way that was, of course, you being a friend to me, but also still being a friend to Bob. You would say, like, Kelly, you have to be positive. You've got to move forward. And you would say things like, it's okay to it's okay to move on with your life. You've got to mm-hmm. move on with your life. Mm-hmm. And you were one of the first people of Bob's friends, especially, that kind of gave me that security that, all right, well, if Bob's friends are telling me that it's okay to move on with my life, in mm-hmm. a sense, you, you never move on, you move forward. You know? I remember that. I mean, I, you... 
I was like, well, if I have Jeff's blessing to do so, then okay. Then it must be also coming from Bob too, you know? The way I see it, and I appreciate you remembering all that, and and I, you're not my only friend who's lost partners. And the ones I get mad at are the ones that two, three years later, they're still living in the same room. They still have their exes, their, 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 their loved ones stuff around. They, they're not going out with their friends. They're not dating. And I'm like, what are you doing? Life is short. You, you have to keep yourself full. Yeah. And if you start, and, you know, the 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 part that's hard for me is you know sometimes i do it to a fault where i don't even want to stay home i i i have tremendous fomo all the time i want to go out every night i don't want to miss a thing um and i do need to let myself like heal and take my time sometimes when some of this happens like when bob died I was on a plane, you know, a few, you know, after the, the next day after the funeral, I was. Uh, hey, you went to London. I right? went to Paris. Oh, Paris, yeah. <laughs> well, the difference with that, Jeff, is I believe that was a Chappelle trip. And <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be mourning yeah. and you're grieving, what I've learned is that there's no better people to be around than comedians. Yeah. So if you're going to have to be sad and grieving but you're stuck with Chappelle going to Europe <laughs> like you're going to be laughing the whole time too yeah so it was a good it was a good cathartic experience to go away with friends right after and we were back in time for his memorial at the comedy store which uh you can watch on Netflix believe it or not yeah um, yeah uh and- dirty daddy the Bob Saget tribute. Which I love so much. I just love, I love that the way people from different worlds come out for Bob. And like, it's to your point, which I guess was my point earlier, which is we mourn and then we move on. Like you celebrate someone that you love and that you care about. And you don't have to, you move forward. Like you said, you, you take them with you. And one of the reasons I talk about Bob and uh, a couple of my other buddies in my show is because I want to keep their name alive. And sometimes it's like, wow, well, I don't want to talk about this ever so often. But And then when I get up there, I can't wait to tell people what a great guy my friends are, what, what yeah. great gals some of my friends are, like the people that come up in the show. And I like it. I like keeping their names alive. And I, there's a strength in that. Right. And then it's also kind of, I haven't thought about this really, but it's also kind of calming because you know that someone, you know, maybe someone will do that for you, me when I'm gone. And I like that. I think that's like, that's why we're here. Well, yours will just be one big roast that you'll, <laughs> you'll have earned and deserved. <laughs> and, but then, you know, once again, like there were times And I've said this before, but literally the day Bob passed away, you were the only person who I felt I, like, you're the first person I cracked a joke with Uh and that I felt like it was okay to do that with. Uh But he, and of course, I don't want all of this to be about him, but it does bring me to a next topic of a special part in your relationship with him was that when you were going through something, if you had a hard time or, you know, a loss or a breakup or something like you would call Bob right. and he would do what for you? He would take me out for meat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean like, you know, like gay bars, like, which is fun too, but he would take me out for meat. We would go to get a uh, pastrami or beef ribs or a steak. That was our kind of like, that was our comfort food. Okay, well, <laughs> so you know, we might possibly... But now that I'm vegan, <laughs> Bob would be really just... Oh, disappointed. no. Now, oh, that no. I went, now that I went vegan... No, Why didn't just, you tell me that before? Uh, All right, Jeff, the yeah. day that you go vegan will be a bigger loss to me 
than losing Bob. I'll tell you that much because I'll feel like a part of me has truly died if I find out that you are vegan. Uh, it's good to see that you've adopted Bob's sixth sense of humor. Oh, man. But that's so nice that he would kind of literally, what, like pick you up and take oh, yeah. you out for... It didn't matter what time. Take you to it a is. deli or a. One or time a, we just went to Astro Burger and ate pastrami sandwiches in his car, which I couldn't believe he let me do because I'm, I'm a sloppy eater. He never let me eat. <laughs> maybe we sat up. Maybe, maybe we ate. Maybe we sat on the roof. I don't remember. I but. think once he let me eat in and out burger in his car, and I was not. He was not happy about it. <laughs> but more often than not, we would go out for beef ribs. We there are not too many places you can get good beef ribs. You know, I grew up in the catering business, so. Um, prime rib, everybody at all these fancy weddings would be out for hundreds of people, but then there'd be ribs left from all the prime ribs. So I would eat the ribs and they were my favorite. Well, I think the last time yeah. we had beef ribs yeah. was when on January 9th, 2023, so exactly one year, the year, one year anniversary of Bob passing, we had a little get together at my house. It was me, you, John Mayer, Adam Saget, and my sister, Kristen. Right. right. And you brought the most massive tray <laughs> of beef ribs, enough for easily 20 people. And it was for five of us. And John, I don't think, ate any. You had like two. I had one. Adam maybe had one. And then you just left them all there as if I was supposed They're to. They're like Fred Flintstone sized <laughs> ribs, too. Yeah. So. Well, I hope you got a dog or something. No, I do not have a dog. I ate a couple, but I'm sad to say that they went to waste. The ones that we have for you today will not go to waste. And in a minute, I'm also going to be making a cocktail for you because you are so far the latest podcast guest we've had where this is it's five o'clock here and right. somewhere. So right. we're going to we're going to have a cocktail, too. Um, Who would want to eat all this during the, like you go, oh, it's comfort food. I go, all right, well, I'm not coming in the morning. Like, <laughs> You know, guys, is that is that is that a flaw in our uh, in our? <laughs> no, I see. I can see here? a lot of people would want it for lunch. Some people breakfast, but I, as a comedian, I this is lunchtime. Yeah, this is my lunch. I have breakfast. This is lunch. Okay. Sometime around midnight, I'll probably have dinner. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, before the food comes in, I'm going to make you a cocktail. What do we make? Ooh. So oh. this is like a fall version of an old fashioned. Oh. So check this out. Here's what we're doing. Some hand flavored ice. Okay. So I am going to make an old fashioned with a really good quality scotch, which you normally don't do because you don't want to like waste a good scotch for a cocktail. Right. But I just don't care because you're very special to me, Jeff. Thanks, Cal. So. Oh, look at that. So we've got some Oban 14 here. Wow. You hear the little, the little uh, cork popping. Very exciting. So I'm not measuring. I'm measuring with my heart. Okay, so that's a lot. Do that. Whoa, well, this is for two. Okay, oh, and really then I'm gonna do instead of um simple syrup or like a sugar cube, we're gonna do some maple syrup. Oh, so this is uh gonna give it a little bit more of like a fall flavor when you want to get drunk, but you also want pancakes. <laughs> that's an old David Tell joke about eggnog. Okay, so look at that. Stir, 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 stir. So this is the first cocktail of the podcast? This is the first cocktail of the podcast. Wow. I feel weird, like, sitting down making a cocktail normally. Because, you know. What did you eat with John Stamos? Chicken pot pie. Really? Yeah. And his was really hot, and mine wasn't, so he wasn't really, like, able to eat his as well. <laughs> he just complained the whole time that his was too hot. He has a sensitive, he's a sensitive man. <laughs> So I did bring oranges, but I forgot to bring them in. So it's okay. Oh, look at that! Cheers, Jeff. To you and your new podcast. Oh, thank you. To you and uh, and your bananas. <laughs> thank you, and to Bob. I love it. Yeah, yeah. pretty good, right? Really for for, good. for a seated cocktail. What did Katie Corrick eat? Um, Katie had meatloaf and mashed potatoes. Everyone's been like mushy food. There's been a lasagna. Really? There've been a penne alla vodka. Oh. We've had a. Penny Bolognese. Oh. Um, we've had like a Thanksgiving meal. Oh. Uh huh. You're, really, and, you're yeah. really doing it. Yeah, we're doing it. Um, we had like some breakfast foods. Oh, we had Chick fil A. 
Really? Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and Amanda Klutz, uh, hers was grilled cheese and waffle fries. Grilled cheese and waffle. But like what a, is she a five year old? Yeah, but like an old fashioned grilled cheese, not like a fancy one, like right. a diner grilled cheese. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. So. Well, this is hitting me hard because I, I haven't eaten all day. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? Oh my god! Are you kidding me? Nope. All right, so we're gonna attempt to eat this. this okay. Is epic. So, guys, let me explain. You must have been up since. Just kidding. Yeah. So no, I did not make this. Um, no, hurry however, up, but tell tell me before so, it, while it's hot. So this is I can't eat it cold. Barbecue beef ribs because Jeff loves beef ribs, and this pastrami sandwich is a nod to the pastrami sandwiches that Bob would take you out for whenever you were having a you tough are time. So cute. And I know you love beef ribs, of course. You know, Bob did too. Guys, I think uh, I think we found a winner here. I think this is the. The comfort food of all foods. Yeah. So now that I have you all comforted, yeah, I want you to be happy. I'm feeding you to be for you to be happy. So what we do a lot on here is, you know, obviously we've talked about, you know, things that can be really difficult, but the whole point is how can we take those things, learn from them, and then help other people who are going through them. For instance, not only like what helped you when you've gone through hard times because not only have you gone through hard stuff, but you've been a friend to so many people who have gone through hard stuff. And I've learned so much through this process about how to help others too, because I had never really lost anybody before Bob. And I saw people the way they helped me, like you, for instance, now I'm going to be a better friend going forward to people who lose people because I kind of know what to do now. You know? I love that. So, because you, you really started, you lost, like Bob, you lost a lot of people mm. from a pretty young age. Mm-hmm. And would you say that how you, like, and the advice that you've learned over the years has kind of evolved and changed? Or would you say that the advice that you would give your... Yeah. Teenage self is different than what it would well, be now. In my 20s, in my early 20s, my parents passed away when I was a teenager. So I did take care of my mom who had leukemia, but it was more of an emotional taking care, not a physical. So I guess I probably took care of her. She'd be home. She was sick for a couple weeks. They told her she'd have six months to live. She lasted two years. <clears throat> and she got really sick. So it was almost a relief when she passed away. And how and old were you? I was, uh, I was from 12 to 14, she was sick. Oh, gosh. And my dad died when I was 19. So it's pretty close together. Yeah. And my grandfather, you know, moved in with me after college, and I didn't realize this term even existed till recently. A caregiver. <clears throat> I always thought that was a nurse or somebody who takes care of people in hospice care. And it was only later that I was enlightened to the idea of caregivers. I thought, yeah, I lived with my grandfather for two years while he had all these old man things wrong with him, angina and esophageal cancer and diabetes and shingles. And he was in the hospital seven months out of his last two years while I was becoming a comedian for the first time, trying comedy, going to open mics in New York City from New Jersey. And I remember... Taking, you know, taking him to the doctor a few times a week and looking after him. And then I would, like I said, he'd give me that banana and some money for the tolls and gas. And I would go do comedy uh, in New York City or wherever. And I'd come home and hope and pray that I was going to walk into someone who was alive, breathing. Because when someone's sick, you don't know what you're walking home to. We didn't have cell phones my neighbor, we we didn't have a lot of family around. So we were really like taking care of each other. And at the time I was like, it just felt like necessity. It just felt like survival. Like Trent, he was my best friend. I loved him. So I wasn't thinking too much about like, how did I get stuck with this? You know? And it, 
I figured out to answer your question decades later, because I heard other people talk about, oh, my mom wants to move in with me and this one and that. People complain about their parents and you hear a lot of like, I got to take care of my dad. He's got dementia. And you hear this stuff as you get older, you hear it more and more. And I always tell them what I learned about myself, which is you'll be so proud of yourself after they're gone when you look back and go, wow, I really took care of that person. I really took some time out of my trajectory, out of my agenda, out of my life. Um, So it's more not you have to take care of them, but you get to take care of them. Yeah, sure. Because I feel rewarded about it. I got so much knowledge and all those free bananas. But at such a young age. That was the unfortunate I mean, part, but I got it out of the way. Both your parents and your grandpa. Yeah, so now I get to do whatever the fuck I want. You know, I try <laughs> to stay po- I try to look at the positives, which is, you know, I'm not taking care of some old sick people now. You know, I know it's a small, uh, but I can't help but take the silver lining because my parents, they loved comedy. They never saw me perform. If they had seen all this, it would have been mind-blowing for me and for them. Plus, I do get a little jealous when my friend's parents come backstage and visit them. And I'm like, man, if I had that kind of positive energy when I was starting out, what what would I have become? Instead, I had to, like, pat myself on the back and go, all right. But what you just said was so interesting and something I've never, ever thought of. But the one, you know, or a silver lining that you can take away from that, as you said, I got it out of the way, mm-hmm. where... I've spent 44 years doing nothing but dreading the day my parents are going to pass away. You know what I mean? And constantly in fear of that. And, oh, my God, how awful is that going to be? Now that I've lost Bob, I feel slightly more equipped to be able to deal with that. But when it happens, as you said, you get it out of the way, it's like, well, you you don't have that fear anymore of you know because you you did it and you made it through and you survived. Yeah. Where on my hand it's like well you have all these years of anxiety of like when's it going to happen, you know, and dreading that day. So I mean I guess that is a silver lining to look at. Of mm. you know? well, you're lucky to have them into your adulthood. You know that's yeah. to me I look at that with jealousy. I go when my friends complain about oh my mom's being an asshole. She's like why. Well, like, man, you're so lucky. Yeah. Or, if the, or, or, or the other thing I would tell people, you know, I don't really solicit advice too much unless I really see that they can easily fix their problem, you know, with friends, you know. But when they ask me, it's like, like sometimes people will say, oh, you know, I'm going to fight with my brother. I'm going to fight with my mom, you know, and these are adults, Fix it. Well, they're being an asshole. I go, who cares? Yeah. Your parents, at a certain point, they start to become, like, ju- young again, like kids. You got to, like, take the high road, be the adult, and just go go over there and call them on Father's Day or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. And don't be so precious about it all because life is so unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes those scares really work. Uh-huh. You know, it's like yeah. the universe saying, like, open your eyes, everybody. You know, this person might not be around. I might not be around. Like my Uncle Joe, I love my Uncle Joe so much. He had a stroke like 10 years ago. We were like, he's done. Goodbye. We'll see what happens. Maybe he'll survive. Maybe he'll be. The, he's like, so he used that. He got out of it and then got lost weight, changed the way he eats, changed his whole lifestyle. And now he's like younger. Right. So these like. These scares sometimes, luckily, I don't think I've had that. Um, but when you see your friends, when you see it happen to your friends sometimes, you start to go, let me try to lo- maybe eat a little less pastrami and re- beef ribs. and <laughs> Sorry, walk. Jeff. <laughs> no, no, it's good. That's what I mean. I haven't had it in a long time, so it was a rare, good, a rare a treat. treat. A rare treat. So what's also so fascinating to me is obviously having been married to a comedian. Yeah. I feel like some of the best 
get to where they are because they've gone through some really, really hard shit. Yeah. Because it's a defense mechanism almost to get through the hard times by using comedy. Mm -hmm. And I know that's what happened to Bob because he had so much death and loss in his life at a very early age that both his sisters, but he lost like four uncles by the time he was 20 or something uh, that all died of heart attacks. And all of that death in his family just made him funny and want to be funny to, because his dad was like that. His dad used gallows humor all the time. And his dad said very inappropriate off color things to try to deal with all the pain. And so that's how Bob got it. And so it sounds like that's kind of where it came from with you as well, because you had gone through all this loss and difficult times at a, at a young age. And you were saying that, you're doing comedy when you're 20, like while your grandpa was in and out of the hospital. It's the unpredictability of life. And if you just, I have trouble sometimes making long-term plans. Someone says, what are we going to do this summer? Or what are you doing for New Year's when they ask me in like the summer? I'm like, I don't know. Like I'll be, I hope <laughs> I make it that far. So that is the downside to it all, which is hard to get close to people because a lot of times you know, people I've gotten close to have died, sometimes suddenly. And sometimes it's hard to make long-term plans because stuff happens that keeps you from doing them. That's so interesting. So to me, I'm more of a, that's maybe why I get FOMO. It's my I'm more like live for today. That's why I like getting instant laughs on stage. What well, Probably why I chose stand-up over other forms of entertainment because it's so immediate. I went to film school, but... Stand- a movie can take years to make. Right. But stand up, I can think of it right now and go on tonight and hear the laughs right now and feel that energy and that positivity right back at me. So it was more of you really wanted the positivity even and, and the laughs versus that you like how Bob did where he kind of became funny because he needed to get through the pain. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we were funny when we were happy, too. Like, my family, my mom and dad were both very funny. My mom was a great laugher, and she had giant tits, so she would <laughs> her tits. I mean, when she was laughing, the whole room laughed. <laughs> the whole room just shook with laughter. And my dad was a very funny guy, and, you know, we're from Jersey, family of ball busters. So it was sort of our love language anyway. You know, laughing and goofing and... Is that where the roasting came from? The ball busting? I think it did. I was... I worked in my dad's catering hall from the time I was a little boy rolling meatballs to a man in college, you know, feeding the staff and cooking for hundreds of people, parking cars, whatever they wanted me to do. So in Jersey, we had the thick skin of just being a Jersey ball buster. You know, you've all seen the Sopranos and all that. You add in like the Irish and Scottish waiters and waitresses, the Russian guy making fruit cups, the Hungarian guy making the jello molds, the retired U S Navy, uh, chef, Jewish guy. And then the mater D who's, you know, maybe French. It was like the UN of catering. Yeah. They had Haitian guys who worked there. They had, uh, people from all walks of life, plus not to mention like brides and grooms from everywhere. So, yeah, I think the roasting came out of that. Like I could just size everything up real quick. And since I was basically the boss's son, you know, I got it the most. People made fun of me too for just being the boss's kid. You're a that, Nepo baby? <laughs> I, if you call, if, if Nepo means working all weekend... <laughs> 15 hours a day in a kitchen all summer long during wedding season while your friends are out having fun. Yes, I was a Nepo baby. (laughs) That's why I escaped and went to college where I majored in getting the fuck out of the catering business. (laughs) (laughs) At what point were you like, this is, this is going to be my life. This is going to be my career. Cause obviously if you went to college, you're not thinking that Comedy was going to be your career at that point. No, it was a happy accident. My buddy Mark Chapin said, take this comedy class. And I was already a college graduate. I'd already had a business for a couple of years out of college, making training films and, and doing some advertising design and stuff like that. And we were struggling, and I wasn't really 
clear that this was for me and my heart wasn't quite in it. And, you know, it was something to try out of film school. And I was taking care of my grandfather. I needed a real, not just a creative outlet, but a social outlet. I was just this, like, chubby loser living in New Jersey with my sick relative. I, was, I had nothing going on. And my buddy said, take this class. It's near the bus station. And, you know, you can take the class and then catch the 11 o'clock bus home and time to, you know, check on your grandfather. And I did. I took the class in stand-up comedy. Oh, wow. <clears throat> a lot of fun. A lot, a lot of fun. Taught by Lee Frank at the in, in Manhattan. And uh, I loved it right away. And I was better than the other people in my class. I could see that There's pretty someone. quickly. And, and, and... I didn't quite understand what stand-up was. I had always thought that was old guys in tuxedos on Johnny Carson. I didn't right. quite get that. Wait, I can be a comic in like a T-shirt? Like what? I could just say anything I want into a microphone? This is like the greatest use of the First Amendment. I, I couldn't believe it. And <clears throat> I dug it right away. And But I really thought of it as a hobby for a long time. Did you have a comedy hero? Well, for me, growing up in Jersey in the 80s, it was the rock star comics. Steve Martin, sick playing banjo and doing crazy jokes with an arrow through his head. And, well, excuse me. And Eddie Murphy in a leather suit being a freaking badass. And the Blues Brothers on SNL singing, you know, Rubber Biscuit and <laughs> and a Soul Man and... Those, that was the kind of comedy that I gravitated towards. It was very big and broad and fun and a little off and silly. Dice. Dice. By the time Dice came around, I was starting to do comedy. Okay. So my early headshots, because I was from New Jersey, the East Coast, I looked like Dice. <laughs> yeah. My first headshot, Dice actually posted once as a joke because I'm imitating him so much with my like slicked back hair and my leather jacket because I was just trying to get booked and he was the biggest thing in the world. So you had to either seem like Dice or uh, Ellen DeGeneres at that point. And I felt like <laughs> you were like, probably... I think uh, more, more Dice-like. <laughs> yeah. Even though my comedy wasn't, um, I was sort of like a little like mix of like my grandfather, my uh, my dad, me, I guess my and uh, and Richard Lewis, and uh, maybe a little Billy Crystal in there, and maybe some dice. And, and it took some years um, just working it until I figured out who I was. And that's about the time where I was like, maybe five six years in, I was like, holy shit! Every joke I write is 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 working. I think I'm figuring this out. And at the same time, I was trying to write for shows and act, but it would always come back to stand-up. It was nothing more fun, more satisfying than stand-up. And I said, well, let me just keep doing it. And if I ever do it at once on TV, I won't care if, I'd ever, if I ever do it again. I don't want it to break my heart the way other things in my life had broken my heart. And I just kept um, taking that attitude where if it went away, I'd be okay. And there were a couple times it did go away. Like I took a break, I... COVID, you know, there's, there's, I got hurt once, like it went away and I was still okay. Of course, like nightfall comes and I just want to be on stage and my leg starts going and I want to make fun of whoever's around. <laughs> when but did the roasting start? The roasting started in the late nineties, the Friars Club. I was already doing stand up, but it kind of happened. Another happy accident where my friend Greg Fitzsimmons invited me to a Friars Club event, and my friend Elon Gold would invite me over to the Friars to play poker. And I got a little bit of a reputation around that world. Um, and on, on a year where they really couldn't get big stars to do the roasts, it kind of came to this new guy, and they tried some new people. And I was like, wow, the roasts. All right, well, let me go to the Museum of Broadcasting, look up the roasts, see how they work. There was no Googling or YouTube so I had to, like, go to the library and see what it was about. <laughs> and I, we, they wanted to roast Steven Seagal, <laughs> who was a big, 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 big action star at the time. And I like that would be an easy one to do. Right. But I really didn't care about him emotionally. But when I figured out that Henny Youngman and Milton Burrow and Buddy Hackett and Abe Vigoda and all these funny comedy people would be there, I was like, oh, that I can wrap my head around. I remember walking out to the... New York Hilton and 
maybe 2,000 people packed into this ballroom at lunchtime. Milton Berle introduced me, gave me some dismissive intro, and I walk out, and I shake his hand, and I look at Steven Seagal, and I look out at all this crowd. It's like, who the fuck is this guy? And I'm like, hey, I, I know you guys don't really know me, but I feel uniquely qualified to be here today because I'm also a shitty actor. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone cracks up except Steven Seagal, who doesn't even understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is really powerful. This is really fun. This is like my hometown. This is my home court now. Like, This is my Yankee stadium. Like, I really was like, this is even another way to do stand-up where – you can write jokes, and then they have a finish line. Like, you're writing them for one night, for one occasion. And that, to me, was so cool. Rather than just do the same act every night over and yeah, over. like tour. Like, yeah, which like I also learned special, to love, yeah. which I also love. But here was something else that I could do that I soon figured out. Oh, I killed at that roast. Then I tried another roast. Then I did another one. Then I did one in L.A. Then I did a private roast. And I was like, wow, I'm like four for four, or five for five. Eventually, I'm going to bomb at one of these things, right? And then I was like, oh, here I am at 8, 9, 10, 20. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm fucking good at this. <laughs> so it took a long time to, to really go like, oh, here comes the one. And yes, of course, I've had bad nights. I'm not trying to be a wise guy. But it's like, this is something that I really love doing. And after a while, I didn't want to just roast celebrities. Um I wanted to be able to roast the fans, so I started bringing up fans uh, who volunteer, who might be going through something in their life or celebrating something on stage, and I line them up and I roast them, and we do the roast battles that we're going to do. Uh, uh, I love the roast battles. Yeah, we're going to do some this summer at the Netflix festival, and it's like, a, you know, comedy has stand-up, sketch, improv, and now there's roast battling. I just think... And I've said it before, just in general, I think stand-up comedy is the hardest job in the world because anyone, well, not anybody, but a lot of people can be public speakers. Like I can be a public speaker. I've, you know, stood on stage in front of hundreds, whatever people, and I can talk, I can right. give a speech, I can, right. but to make people laugh is the hardest thing. Maybe to get, you know, one joke in, okay, but consistently for an entire set to me it's the hardest job there is and to roast people yes obviously a lot of these jokes are pre-written but i have seen you off the cuff roast people like i know these are jokes that you are coming up with on the spot and that is just a whole other level of just being a brilliant comedian because not only can you make people laugh and tell the jokes in the first place, but you can do it quick and off the cuff and where you're doing something that is very uncomfortable for people to do, which is to make fun of somebody. And you've found comfort in the uncomfortable, which is so interesting to me because to me, like I would I'd be like, I don't want to hurt their feelings, but they want you to do it. I had a woman just last month, Named Deanna, she was uh, speaking at an event for Eddie and Jill Vedder's um, EB charity. It's short for a big, long, scary word. But it's this terrible skin disease, oh, yeah. not unlike scleroderma research, which you and I do a lot of work for. Um, and she's a little tiny thing, wheels out in her wheelchair, she had said to me beforehand, I want to be roasted. If you're going to roast people, then I roast me. And uh, she comes out. And I had all these jokes like in my head. And for some reason, she just looked so adorable. And she had a twinkle in her eye. I was just like flummoxed that I couldn't get my... Normally, I would just cream her. I, I was, <laughs> and I just kind of oh. like tripped it up. And she slammed me. She made fun of my head and my outfit. And I didn't see it coming. And... <laughs> And to be up there and be able to be vulnerable and take a joke and laugh at yourself, whether it's them making fun of me or me, me making fun of someone, um, it's very healing. Yeah. People go, oh, your feelings get hurt. No, not if you're volunteering. Not if it's like no. done with some affection and some love and some respect. And this woman, Deanna, she passed away like two weeks later. I remember uh, Eddie and Jill told me that. And... 
she really got the last laugh. She was not well anyway, but, but had a really tough affliction, a heartbreaking disease. Yeah. And you should look that one up because um, it's unimaginable symptoms that hits children. And, you know, here this woman was only 30 years old, 31 years old, Deanna. And, uh, but the idea that she was able to come up on stage, you know, like gladiator style and just put herself out there in front of the roast master and all her friends and family and 2000 strangers and go bring it motherfucker. Like to me, that is so healing. That is, you know, she had this thin skin disease, but she actually had thick skin. You know, she could take a joke, she could dish it out. And to me, that's heroic. That shows such courage. Has there ever been anyone specifically or a type of person or, or anything where you're like, I can't, I can't do it. Like, I just can't, I can't roast them. Like I feel too bad or like where you've been stumped. You <laughs> one know? time, one time I was, I think we were roasting William Shatner on comedy central and, and I was ruthless um, <laughs> with him. And even Betty white was there. I said, William Shatner, um, Speaking of Shatner, Betty White just shat in her pants. <laughs> like, I was ruthless, but my childhood crush was there, Farrah Fawcett. Oh. And I loved Farrah so much as a little boy. And here I was meeting her for the first time. She's, you know, an older woman. Still looked fantastic. And I just couldn't do it. I dropped all the... I just crossed them off. <laughs> I couldn't make fun of her. <laughs> I was like... I was like mesmerized by Farah. Okay, she so then that's what that's what will get you. The the crush factor. <laughs> yeah, like, no, if I have a crush, I definitely... I'm gonna... I'm gonna... I'm gonna yeah, I, I, I have a hard time. Yeah. All right, so it's not somebody you feel bad for. They have a horrible right. disease. Right. <laughs> it's... No, you had her chances poster are, on your wall. Right. If someone asked me to roast them and I bomb, chances are I'm in love with them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my tell. All right. That's the tell, folks. That's the tell. <laughs> well, now I'll know. Now I'll know. Now I'll, you'll be know. On, I'll be on the no, lookout. No, you're very roastable. You'll be at a, you're a layup. I don't think I've ever... <laughs> I don't think... I'm you sure know what? People... There, there have been a couple times where you've been on stage... And like I've been in the audience and you've called me out. You'd be like, my friend Kelly's here or whatever. And I'm always like, oh my God, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? And I'm like, no, I didn't, get, I didn't get roasted. I get thrown off. Like I did a show in New York and my little cousin came on stage the other day. And when friends come on stage, it throws me a little bit. I have a much easier time just ripping on randos. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I'm like, I know the, like the backstory of somebody, it's too complicated. I need to write like real jokes. I can't just like... Yeah. read them and take the piss real quick you know it's a tricky thing it's a, i don't try to analyze it too much because i it's just something i do like instinct yeah you know so but yeah yeah I, well, I will say i'm very grateful to have you in my back pocket as my friend <laughs> who remember i was doing some speech about like bob was getting some award and i had to do a yeah. speech and i was like can you write me a couple jokes yeah and I think I ended up going the sentimental, not jokey route. Right. Um, but but the jokes you wrote me were funny. And I feel very fortunate of that course. I can always be like, Jeff, um, can you write me a, a, little, a little joke for this speech? And it's hard. It's so, it's so hard. Anytime I've gone on stage for anything and I've, remember when we did that comedy store thing, like I wasn't expecting to get a laugh. I mean, for me to be on stage at the comedy store was such a surreal moment because a, right? Because a, I'm not a comedian. B, that is such hallowed ground that I had such almost like imposter syndrome for even being up there. Mm -hmm. But no, you were paying tribute to your. But I was paying right. I was paying tribute to Bob, so I felt okay. It's it's okay for me to be here. But the fact that I even got one small laugh when I was up there I felt so proud of myself and I felt that Bob was like good job honey you did it it was the best you got a little laugh at the comedy store well, Jim Carrey broke the ice when you came up there he said keep it short <laughs> <laughs> the more you talk the more I could eat these ribs okay good you've been such an incredible friend to so many people who have lost people 
I mean, I feel like you're you're the guy now. Like you're you're the guy that like everyone, you know, all these your friends are always losing people. Like I know Sarah lost both of her parents very recently and like you were there for her and um it's you become such a professional at helping people get through these hard times. What would you say your best advice is to people who are going through this and why are you so great at <laughs> supporting people? I think when you go through stuff early, you know, I lost my parents as a teenager. So you learn pretty quickly that it's do or die. And a lot of people in that situation, they would go to drugs, they would drop out of school, they would take whatever little inheritance they had and blow it on good times. Luckily, my dad lied on his life insurance policy, so I didn't get rich. I had to, like, put my nose to the ground and, like, work and, like, get my sister financial aid so we could both go to Boston University and, then, like... It was a necessity. So if you can <clears throat> push through that early loss or whatever, whenever it hits you and immediately recognize that you're vulnerable to outside influences, the devil, if you can keep and just go, oh, my God, look what just happened. Let me just stand up and put two feet in front of another and just keep going. And not dwell on it, even when it's happening. Even while it's happening. Just like you said, you know, you were making jokes the night Bob passed away. I'm not saying to be glib, and I'm not saying to be a wise ass. You know, but I'm saying, like, do it with love. Lead with love. And take time for yourself. Bob used to say, do what's good for you. Yeah. So do what's good for you. And inevitably that'll be good for others too. I remember you were even trying to use that advice. I think it was, there were a couple times where there were some tours you were like, do I do this or do I not? And you were saying, what would Bob say? Yeah. And it was exactly that. Right. Do what's good for you. Like, yeah. is this good for you right now? Yeah. And that's, when you're going through something, it's not a selfish thing to do what's good for you. It's because it's like that when you're on an airplane and they say, you know, to put your oxygen mask on first before you can help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it kind of works both ways. You have to take care of yourself first if you're going to be any of any use to others. But at the same time, it's also helping people and getting the mind off, getting your mind off yourself is what's also very helpful. Like for me, throughout the whole thing, I was like, well, I can't fall apart because I have to be there for Bob's girls. So if I'm putting them first and thinking of them first, then it's a lot easier to not be selfish and think about myself all the time, mm -hmm. you know? I think that was a good attitude. And that's just done with love. That's because you love those girls. They're women and you love them. They might have gotten and, there. And their stepmommy, Kelly. <laughs> you know that Bob made them. That's what he made them call me. Stepmommy, Kelly. Mm -hmm. He'd always say, like, when we'd be around for Thanksgiving or something and we're all getting ready to go to bed or something, he'd be like, say goodnight to stepmommy, Kelly girls. You know, they're in their 30s. <laughs> and I like that. You can use, When you go into porn, if you ever go into <laughs> porn, I think stepmommy, Kelly would be a big seller. I mean, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Write that down, guys. Um, and and they're like, "Good night, stepmommy Kelly." <laughs> and to I mean, to this day, though, every time you know when we talk, if they write me a card or if they're saying anything to me, they're like, "Love you, stepmommy Kelly." Everything's always That's still so stepmommy cute. Kelly. That's so cute. You know. Well, I know you love those girls too. They're the best. I went to see Laura Laura Saget's art show the other day. Of sculptures, really cool. And you and I, we help. Uh, put together Bob's old cool comedy hot cuisine shows. So, like I said, we keep his name alive. 
we well, it's, it's take so on his causes, we continue the nicknames, we joke about him, we cry, we eat ribs in their honor. That's what we do for people. Yeah. And, that's... and, in, the, and in the end, we're doing it for ourselves because I just ate a big plate of ribs. <laughs> and... <laughs> well, I feel very happy that I got to treat you to your first uh, order of beef ribs in a while. Where's the beef? So... It's here on Comfort Food. <laughs> Starring Kelly Rizzo. <laughs> oh, I love you, Jeff. I mean, I feel like I feel I feel very comforted by this. You have always been, I mean, even before, you know, and I don't know if you know this, but from day one of meeting you, you were always so, so kind to me. And you know, a lot, you know, Bob had a lot of friends that you know, depending on the friend, you know, sometimes they can be a little self-involved or, or they don't pay as much attention. And you were always like, hey, Cal, how you doing, Cal? Just so thoughtful and considerate and like always making me feel like a part of the group. And, and from day one, I was always like, team Jeff, Jeff's my favorite. And even when you and Bob would ever have like a moment of, you know, like brotherly, like like right. bickering or something, I would always be like, don't you dare be mean to Jeff. You call him back and you be nice to him right now. I said, I love Jeff and don't you ever talk to Jeff. Like, or you'd be on the phone. He's like, oh, Jeff's driving me or something, you know, something. And I'd be like, don't you talk about Jeff like that. And he's like, oh, he's like, I forgot. He's your favorite. So you were comforting to me. makes me so happy. Yeah. You were comforting to me even before everything happened oh, with Bob. And then that. since then, I just know that you've been the person that, you know, I can always call. You're always going to be there. And, you know, no pressure, of course. But um, you've just been, like, a very constant, consistent, wonderful, generous friend with your time and with, you know, your heart. And um, I'm always going to be forever grateful for you. Thank I you. Love I love you, Jeff. Thanks for this amazing meal. <laughs> And that amazing... I feed people here on Comfort I Food. Love, I love how uh, your memory is so vivid of those early days of meeting you. And, and uh, you know what it was? The reason I would be like that with you was, A, I like when people do that for me if I'm dating somebody because it's hard to bring someone new yeah. into the tribe. Yeah. You know, we're such a close-knit group. And, you know, Bob didn't, you know, he's a lot to protect. He's got a big family and... He was so made, you know, he didn't let people in that, that easily. But more importantly, it was because I knew before I met you or as I was getting to know you how much, just because my talks with Bob, without you there, I knew how much you meant to him and I knew how he sought you out and I knew how he was like, not just smitten, but like, you got him. <laughs> and oh. uh, so that that's a lot of that. Oh, well... I love you so much, Jeff. Of course. Thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me feed you. My pleasure. This is so Last time the ribs were on fun. you, today they're on me. Thank you. They're on my shirt, to oh. be honest with you. All right. And we're going we're gonna to finish eating this. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Today in the studio, we tucked into some beef ribs and a big old pastrami sandwich. These are more specialty items that, I'll be honest, typically taste better when a professional makes them than they do when you're cooking at home. So we're just going to skip the recipe for this episode. From everyone at Comfort Food, Happy New Year. We hope 2024 brings you health and happiness. Comfort Food is produced by Wheelhouse DNA for Acast. Our executive producers are Fanny Baudry, Cassie Berman, Leah Sutherland, and yours truly, Kelly Rizzo. Our audio producer is Chiara Noni. Special thanks to Camila Goldenberg and Riley Oville Rank for production assistance. Our audio engineer is Matthew Blocka. Our editor is Nick Karismi. This podcast is hosted by me, Kelly Rizzo. If you like the show, please rate us five stars and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in.